The Trump thought leader means you have to lead thoughts. So I see speakers get up and they just regurgitate existing platitudes and truism. Like, hey, work hard, but we already know that. So what a thought leader does is reveal something that you don't know. Today's keynote speaker, Josh Linkner, is a rare blend of business. He has been a founder and, and CEO of five tech He's companies. He's performed over 1,000 concerts around the world as a professional He's jazz guitarist. He's helped over 100 startups launch Globally and scale. recognized innovation He's expert. New York Times bestselling author. Everyone, please. Please welcome Josh Linkner. My busiest year, I did 163 keynotes. I made every mistake you could make, most of them twice. I had to learn tools of, and stage mechanics. I had to learn how to tell a story. I had to learn effective communication. I spent a lot of years just trying to figure that stuff out. I watched tape and I'm thoughtful about story construction. I'm learning new skills. I felt like weird and awkward and such. I was a total introvert, but I don't have the luxury to sit back and wait. I have to go try it, even if I screw it up. I have to put myself in a tough situation. The notion of give generously, don't keep score. It's more of the social, can I contribute? Can I elevate others? Can I make a difference in people's lives in the context of abundance without saying, well, what's in it for me? To me, it's a, a beautiful way to go through life. There are very few things in life that's intrinsically rewarding as the expression of creativity. So I just feel like I'm on this mission to do this work that I believe matters. And I'm pursuing something that, that I think is more of a calling than a vocation. I think if someone wants to learn to speak, you should be watching speeches all the time. Like TED Talks, multi storytelling talks, watch other professional speakers, look at their demo reels, study their past. Do you think anybody can be a keynote speaker? Um, Your mission is to unlock dormant creativity. You've become the world's foremost expert on innovation. Um, in 2007, you started speaking on that on a, on a large scale. So talk about that moment where you sort of pivoted away from full-time running companies to becoming a full-time author and speaker. How did you know that it was time to make that transition? What were some of the internal cues that you experienced? Yeah, um, you know, I sort of reinvented a few different times throughout life, but I, it's more like different chapters almost. And so as mentioned earlier on, I was a musician and, and eventually I got to the point where I had people telling me, they're like, hey, and I know it's an inverse correlation between musical uh, reward intrinsically and economics, which is the opposite. In other words, I go play a bad gig at a wedding and I make more money than if I played a great musical gig at a jazz club. And so people would often tell me, other musicians, they say, just play that other junk thing you hate for free for money and then do the stuff you love for free. So I thought, okay, okay, if I'm going to be an artist and, and, and celebrate the art that I love, why don't I do something like this more profitable for money instead of say, singing in a wedding band? And so I did make a conscious decision not to pursue music permanently. And um, I look back sometimes and question that decision, honestly, although I just did feel like a jazz musician at my core. Um, I still play regularly. I played a concert last week in, in, um, in Vegas. I'd love to tell you about that in a minute. But um, so I still play and I still get a lot of joy and passion out of it. But I made a, I made a deliberate choice. And then as I sold different companies and I made a choice to go on to the next thing, and I have been, I'm excited always about the next chapter. Not, I don't like cling to something in the past. But um, what happened was I started a, a venture capital firm in 2010. We were really on a mission to help re re rebuild the city of Detroit. We, we batched sort of non-traditional entrepreneurs in inner city Detroit, gave them not just money, but coaching and support and mentorship. And we really built this whole movement around revitalization of Detroit. Through tech this was back when houses were like $500 in Detroit, right? Yeah, the company, uh, the city went through the largest municipal bankruptcy in, in, in American history. It was, and, and we, we tried to help, you know, kind of get that going. But, but simultaneously, I was launching the speaking practice and I was writing books and I loved, my heart was just drawn to that. I felt like it was my calling. And so, it, it, and I, so I did both for a while, actually, uh, as you might imagine. But, but in 2014, my partner uh, bought me out of our venture firm. We had a bit of a philosophical disagreement. And, um, and at the time, my speaking practice was really exploding. So it didn't feel weird. It just felt kind of natural to move into that. And I'll tell you, the way, when I think about work, people ask me like, hey, when are you going to retire? When are you going to slow down? And I always think about if, if I was doing something I hated in exchange for money, like it was a means to an end only, it would be as fast as I possibly could if the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. But I'm the opposite of that. I feel like I'm doing something that I'm called to do, that it's my life's work that I want to be remembered doing. And so when I'm work working, it doesn't feel like labor. It feels like joy and play and love. And I mean, minute, like there are, there are things that go bad on given days, but, but for the most part. And so I don't ever want to retire because that would mean that I have less, I don't have anything else to contribute. And so what really drew me to speaking and writing is this notion that all human beings are creative, period. We can express creativity in different ways. I play jazz guitar. I can't draw a stick figure. It doesn't mean I'm not creative. 
And so someone's creativity might show up in the way that they are a salesperson or, or, or navigate a, a problem or, or manage supply chain or whatever. You don't have to be a, a quote unquote creative in a, in a sense of like painting on canvas or, or writing poetry. We can find ways to be creative in every job on the planet and every field and every endeavor. And so I believe, this is a core belief of mine in my heart, that there are 7 billion of us walking around this earth with very levels of dormant creative capacity. My, my, me too, by the way. And so at the same time, I look at a world that's filled with challenges and problems from you name it, you know, climate change, racial divisiveness, income inequality, uh, business challenges, et cetera. And, and to me, the answer is sitting right there. It's that dormant creative capacity. All human progress at some point, like from the printing press to the wheel and fire, like it all started with human creativity. And so if there's all these problems in the world and the answers are locked inside people's heart and I can help unlock that, to me, that's like a duty and a responsibility. And like, to me, the world's a better place. So yeah, I, I make money from doing that, but that's like a secondary thing. To me, if I can make the world better by unlocking people's creativity, which is better for the world, and by the way, it's better for humans. There are very few things in life that's intrinsically rewarding as the expression of creativity. Like, it's better for everybody. And so I just feel like I'm on this mission to do this work. And so. Yeah, sometimes if I'm in a bad hotel room and I don't get a good night's sleep, I'm not happy about that. But what I am happy about is that I'm doing work that I believe matters. And I do, I'm pursuing something that, that I think is more of a calling than a, than a vocation. And, and it's, it's, it's apparent when you're around you, like I've been around you several times over several days watching you uh, at, at work. And, you know, you're, you're in my mind, the guru of, of keynote speaking. But I want to go back to the early days, right? You're a collector of stories. I've read your books. They're full of wonderful stories about innovation, about creativity. And when you reflect back on those first couple of keynotes that you deliver, did your ability to tell a good story translate to the stage? Were you a natural or what were some of the, and you have been playing on you know jazz stages for a while. So did, did that sort of prepare you for this new new calling of becoming a keynote speaker? What was that experience like? I'm so glad you asked that question because sometimes when people see a performer of any type, someone on Broadway, an athlete, a musician, they just think it's natural because they make it look easy. Mm -hmm. But anytime you see someone making it look easy, they probably was because they did the work. You know, they, you think about you know, a basketball starting to practice for hours and hours and made countless sacrifices. Now it looks easy and they look, oh, this is their natural talent. And I, I feel like I had some, a little bit of musical talent, maybe, and a little bit of storytelling talent. But I, I attribute more that I just did the work, man. Like, I, I studied the craft. And, and I watch, to this day, I watch tape. And I'm, I'm thoughtful about story construction. I'm learning new skills. It's just like being a musician. Like, I, I maybe have a little bit of talent, but I, 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 I played to my fingers blood, man. Like, I, I work with metronomes until the batteries fall out of the metronomes. So, like, like, you know, that's how you get good at something. And I looked at, at the stage as no different. You know, to me... It's an, it looks like it's just a natural thing, but there's really a craft to it. So I had to learn the craft. The answer to your question is my first keynote is terrible. I'm sure I'll, I'll look at the ones I'm doing today in several years and think they're terrible too. That's okay. But I, I had to learn the, the, the tools of, and stage mechanics. I had to learn how to tell a story. I had to learn effective communication. How do people learn? And, and, and so I spent a lot of years just trying to figure that stuff out. And I'm sure I've gotten a little bit better, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's just like no musician would ever say, I'm done. I've learned everything there is to know. You're always trying to discover new possibilities. And I feel the same way about keynote speaking. Did you have mentors in those earlier years or were you just having to go to the library and check out books on keynote speaking and try to figure it out for yourself? Because this is prior to, you know, apps and, and online communities and, and all of that. Yeah, I had a couple, you know, I, I, I had more like mentors that I Sort of knew a little bit, but I couldn't get together with them once a week. So Seth Godin was a mentor of mine. Sir Ken Robinson was a fabulous speaker. Unfortunately, he passed, but a mentor of mine. Um, but I did eventually say, right, I often speak at, at my company. You know, I, I was speaking at our corporate events, and I got really good feedback, so that was kind of validating. I thought to myself one time, how do I go from being like good amateur to at least a bad profession? What would that look like? And so I, I did the work. Like I hired a, a guy named Dr. Nick Morgan. I'm so friends with him. He's amazing. He lives in Boston and he was like my speaking coach. And I worked with him for six months and I flew to Boston in the middle of snowy Januarys and hung out with Nick. And, 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 and I, what I said to him is I said like, Hey, just give me like the most brutal feedback you can. I said, get, get rid of the like, nice stuff. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. And so like, I would bring a recording with him and we'd sit for two days and it'd be a 60 minute keynote and we'd unpack that entire 60 day, the, the entire two days would be about that. 
Like I walk, I take one step toward the stage. Stop. What's wrong? Like, what'd you do with your foot? Why'd you do that? Look the way your vision is. You look like this. You see your posture, and he just like ripped me to shreds, which I thought was the greatest thing ever. Because I'm like, sweet, I'm learning. Now I know what not to do. And so he he was like my Yoda, frankly, and helped me develop skills. But since that time, I still have mentors. I, I learned from you, man, watching you and the way presence. I learned from my, my friend Ryan Estes, who's an incredible presence on stage, and not in a way of trying to emulate somebody else, but to learn different different ways of human connection, human communication. So I, you, you learn patterns and ideas from others, and then ultimately you develop your own voice, uh, which is what you do in music and what you do certainly as a speaker. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. So today you've delivered what, like 1500 keynotes? around the world since I think, I, I think the count is a little over 1300 and running uh <laughs> i i won tomorrow and i'm still pretty active in it which i, I just again i do this because i love it right and w- what would you say just to get a little more technical on this because i want to talk about the community that you created in a bit but for people who are listening to this who may have you know gone up and given a couple talks here and there and versus someone who this is what they do they're doing 100 talks plus a year what would you say the biggest difference is from a technical perspective? Um, a question. You know, it's a little hard to answer because there are different routes to the same thing. It's like saying, you know, well, country musician plays differently than a jazz musician. It's not that one is right or wrong. Technically, they're just, they're different. And mm-hmm. so there are different types of speakers. An example is, uh, you know, my dear friends is Heather McGowan and her mind is unbelievably huge, like cerebral, unbelievably smart, deeply researched, a little academic almost. And, and her stylistic approach is so different than mine. doesn't mean hers is right or wrong. Mine's not right or wrong. It's just different. I think the key thing is that eventually you're bringing a part of you to the surface. Um, one key thing is that people who are um, successful are sharing, their, you know, the term thought leader. By definition, you have to lead thoughts. So I think sometimes speakers get up and they just sort of regurgitate existing platitudes and truism. Like, hey, work hard. Like, and there's nothing wrong with working hard, but we already know that. So what a thought leader does is reveal something that you don't know. A thought leader might say, we might think that the key to success is hard work, but I'm going to show, show you today why that's not it at all. Oh, I'm curious now because you're, you're contradicting an existing belief rather than, than reinforcing one. So I think a lot of it has to do with one's ability to you know, develop their own voice as, as not only as a former, but an authentic human and, and, and have a perspective and a point of view that's different rather than complying with what everybody else thinks. And then obviously stage mechanics happen in, in a number of ways. The way I look at it is um, e- each thing is almost like, like I play guitar. So, so I think about chords. So I might know 20 chords. And with those 20 chords, I could play every Beatles song, every Rolling Stones song, most Taylor Swift song, et cetera. But I never, you never like, well, I can't write any more songs because I've already used those chords. There's always a new song to be created by originally stacking those chords in different patterns. And that's how I look at keynote speaking also is that, you know, you can learn different chords and phrasings, if you will, different techniques. But then you're really an artist, you're a performing artist, and it's your job to apply those in a way that drives a point of learning and, is, and insight. And then next time you're going to apply them in a different way. And so you're always experimenting, you're always learning. One might say you're always playing a little jazz. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of newer speakers as well, myself included, had, have a tendency to, to weigh information heavier than, say, a good story that can illustrate that, that information. And... Um, and that's something that I've also read about you is that, you know, as a venture capitalist and you're hearing pitches from people, you're looking for the person who not, who doesn't come in and say, Hey, I want to just make a bunch of money, <laughs> as much money as possible. You're looking for somebody who has a little bit of a story associated with their purpose, their why, why they, they have to do this, this project. And I think a lot of that may translate on the stage as well when it comes to keynote speaking just putting a little more emphasis on why you're the person that believes in this and, and, and that's taken on this mission. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, you, from a venture capital pitch to a keynote, what, 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 one difference maker is, is somebody coming at it from a selfish intent or a noble intent? So if an entrepreneur comes into me and says, hey, I, I just want to 
run over my customers and like screw my employees so I could make a bunch of money and have a great outcome at the end so I could buy a Ferrari. It's like fingernails on a blackboard. Bad. That's terrible. Who's going to back that person? You know, on the other end, if someone says, but then I have this, 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 this idea that's going to elevate the learning outcomes for, 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 for at risk kids in, in, a, in an environment. And I'm really driven by solving this problem to make the world better. And there's an economic opportunity too. Like that's so much better. And so the, the mistake that keynote speakers, speakers make is they think it's about them or they approach it about me, me, me. And like, and, and that just audiences reject that. It just feels icky. Whereas if, you really kind of feel it. If someone shows up with a heart that's, Hey, it's about you, not me. It's not look what I can do. It's look what you could do. And if you're there us out of service instead of out of boastfulness or arrogance, that's what makes for a good keynote. And that's what people want to pay attention and listen. So obviously you did this on your own for a while, and then you developed this community or co-founded this community, Impact 11, which was once known as Three Ring Circus. Talk a little bit about some of the pain points that you experienced, some of your keynote speaking colleagues experienced that led to the genesis of Impact 11. Yeah, what happened is uh, in, in my speaking work, I, I made every mistake you could make, most of them twice. I, you know, I, I screwed a bunch of stuff up and eventually, you know, kind of figured it out and I got some momentum, you know, I, I, my busiest year, I did 163 keynotes, you know, it was a real moment. And, and people kept asking me like, can, can you show me how to, how to accelerate my practice or, I, or I'm new to this. I want to become a keynote speaker. And when I was getting started, there were no like high quality training options for that. If you were a lawyer, you could go to the thing like, how do you build a law practice? But, but there wasn't anything like, how do you build a speaking practice? The stuff that was out there, frankly, was like this get rich quick nonsense. Like you could be a zillionaire, give, you get paid big bucks to speak. And it was just like the opposite vibe. And those people weren't professional speakers anyway. They were like snake oil salespeople. And so it's partly out of service and generosity and want to help others. And there's plenty for everybody. Again, abundance mindset. Um, I just started this thing where I was, would help other kind of speakers. And, and, and it, it sort of blossomed into this thing I didn't even imagine at first. But it came from a place of, of, of service and say, I want to help elevate our industry. Let's add a le level of professionalism to the craft. And, and we just show in you know, a very no BS way, like what are the specific things you need to do to launch and scale a speaking practice? And so what ended up happening is over time in, in COVID, I teamed up with three of my dearest friends, Ryan Estes, Seth Madison, and Peter Sheehan, who are widely successful speakers. All of them, by the way, are better speakers than me, just to be clear. But um, we, we, we teamed up and, and they said, I like what you're doing. You know, we kind of decided to do work and business life together. And, um, and, and we, we, we collaborated and you know, it's now Impact 11. And what we've built is, uh, it's pretty cool. It started out as more of a training thing, but it's, it's now become this vibrant community where, where people can, can, can become better together. They can learn from each other, not just from someone teaching them a, a, a technique. And, and we all sort of navigate life and our, our calling, our individual callings of making an impact on the world and helping each other get there and celebrating both the, the victories together and, and picking each other up from the setbacks and, and it's really a, become a beautiful thing. I'm deeply proud of it. And I, I get no credit for the vision of it. it. It happened more organically than that, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I originally found out about it through Ben Nimpton, who I guess came to, came to it back in the earliest days, right? And um, Ben had, sh can you share Ben's story a little bit about how he got into keynote speaking? Yeah, and so Ben is a dear friend and I have so much love and respect for him. He, um, he in early 2017, right? Well, I think I started this in 2016. And so he came in 2017 to a boot camp of ours. And he was really new to speaking. Like he'd done a couple of speeches, no fee consistency. He was just really getting started. And we, we kind of hit it off. And I tried, you know, before he even came, I, I did a few coaching sessions with him to, you know, help him organize his content. We became, you know, dear friends. Um, but Ben, to his credit, not mine, just to be clear, really took off. I mean, he's become this wild and successful speaker. You know, you know, millions and millions of dollars of revenue, making a huge impact on giant stages. And um, his, his whole thing, you know, he he he, uh, he pursued these things that seemed impossible. It's sort of a bucket list of, of, of the possible things, and really went for them. And what his talk is about is, look what he did. Oh, look at me! I got this shoot with Obama, which is kind of a fun thing, but it's really more like I I pursued something that was seemingly impossible, figured it out, and so can you. So his message is he helps audiences, leaders make the impossible possible. And so once again, his success isn't tied to he did cool stuff. His success is tied to helping other people achieve what they want. And so once again, it's an act of service and generosity and kindness that I think has fueled his, his remarkable success. Yeah, and I, I attended a boot camp a couple of years ago in uh, Detroit. And it, it sounds like kind of what you described with Dr. Nick Morgan, where 
you learn stagecraft, you learn budgeting, you learned how to talk about your fee and, and all the little nooks and crannies and the ins and outs of developing a business of becoming a keynote speaker, which was a lot of it was really eye-opening for me because before that, I was mostly giving talks extemporaneously. You know, I didn't really have a structure that I was kind of adhering to. And you got to see how scientific a lot of these these uh, principles can be. And if you can master the science and the art of it together, you can really experience a hockey stick growth in your speaking career. That, that, that's exactly right. And so, um, again, you take anything, look, look, at, look at athletics. You know, it looks like these people are just amazing and they know exactly where to go on the field, but there's actually plays that they want and there's drills that they practice. And so what, what looks so natural is actually you can kind of break it down and say, what was, what was the methodology that allowed them to get there? It's not restricting, by the way, their, their individuality or their ability to be creative. It's just providing a framework. And so that's what we tried to do in Impact 11 is provide a framework that isn't so prescriptive that it's restrictive, but it's, it's helpful in, in, in creating, you know, kind of some scaffolding to, to figure out where you need to do, what you need to do next and how do you accelerate the path to market? How do you ultimately deliver with the biggest possible impact? And so, yeah, that, that's what we, we've tried to do is, is break down the weird ethereal concepts into like kind of concrete step-by-step -step approaches. Yeah. And it's growing, it's expanding. You're doing it, you're doing boot camps all over the country. Uh, there's been one in Austin, there's San Diego, there's Phoenix, et cetera. There's a whole online community component now. What's sort of the longer term vision for what you all are creating? Well, there's a lot of thought leaders with and people who have a message on their heart that want to figure out how do they get it to the world. And not only how do they commercialize it, but how do they drive the biggest spots of live back? You know, we can sort of become the, the, the gold standard of that on a global basis in helping people, you know, achieve better economic results, but more importantly, better impact results with their message. You know, I, we'll, we'll look back and that, that's kind of like a life well lit. I mean, that, that's pretty cool. And then to be able to do it with friends that we love and respect and learn from, and we get to have the, the human connection that comes from that and the community that comes from it, that, that's kind of what we're trying to do. I mean, we're, we're continuing to add new ideas and content and structure and IP and all that, but the underlying thing is that. We are also expanding a bit um, into helping corporate leaders become better on stages. Um, so think about not someone who wants to become a paid speaker, but somebody who's speaking in front of their 2,000 customers at the annual event and, and generally isn't that good. It's not their fault, by the way. I believe that, that effective presentations are the most, one of the most important but least trained skills in business today. And so we're sort of taking some of our IP and helping uh, business leaders who, again, aren't necessarily to make, making a career change but they have a direct economic benefit if they are better uh, in those high stakes moments. And so that, that's another area that we're expanding into and we feel really good about. Uh, because I, again, I think about eradicating the suffering of bad corporate presentations. Yeah, we can all use a little bit of that. Yeah, and you've written uh, three New York Times bestselling books. Most of your books are on innovation and creativity. You have yet to write the definitive book on stage performance and keynote speaking. But for someone out there listening to this who is wanting to get more into that, what are some of the considerations that you would suggest that they incorporate into their training protocols? Really good question. And, and it's, it's almost a little hard to answer. I mean, one thing is, is crucial, I think, is watching tape. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I was learning music. I just listen to music a lot. And, I, and you start to emulate, you know, how did, how did Charlie Parker play this? How did Miles Davis play that? And you start by imitation, and then, then over time you develop your own voice. So you, you got to get good inputs. And so I think if someone wants to learn to speak, you should be watching speeches all the time. Watch TED Talks, multi storytelling talks, watch other professional speakers, look at their demo reels, you know, study the craft. That'd be one thing. Um, there's a lot of technical things about stage crafting you can learn over time. Those, those are learnable skills. There's technical, structural things like how to structure good keynotes. Those are learnable skills. But I think the biggest thing is, is commit to it like it's a, like you're learning a new language or learning a new instrument. It's a little weird because we speak all the time. Like we, we, we can communicate and you know, go to coffee, but communicate. But, but, but effective keynote speaking is a little different than that. And people can confuse it. They're like, oh, I gave a great speech at my aunt's wedding. And therefore, I'm ready to be a professional speaker. Doesn't mean that's not good. Like, speeches at weddings are awesome. But, but, but you kind of need to learn the, the professional skill set that goes around being effective on stage. So I would just encourage anybody, watch a bunch of tape, practice the way you'd be practicing to learn a new instrument. 
and, and, and develop a, use a training protocol, develop a training protocol. Instead of just thinking, oh, I'm so charismatic and everyone wants to hear my story, put, put your performance under the microscope, you know, really understand it. And then, and then test a lot of stuff, you know, test delivering a story one way versus another way. How did it feel? How was the audience reaction? And so I think that the headline here is treat, if you want to be a professional, treat the craft professionally. Mm. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit here. Let's suppose someone comes to you, Josh, and says, Hey, I love this idea about watching tape. Can you recommend your top five TED talks or just anything online that I can find that you really love and you think that the people who are giving these talks give do an excellent job? What would they be? I can. I can. The only caveat is it's sort of like saying, you know, who are your five favorite musicians? Mm-hmm. And my five might be different than somebody else's five. And just sure. there, there's a little personal touch to this. And so I would suggest that people follow speakers that they relate to and they, they kind of align with their subject matter. So I'll, I'll answer your question, but in, there's a personal element to it. Um, but the ones I'd recommend, my, my again, previous mentor of mine, Sir Ken Robinson, gave a, talk, a TED Talk called um, How Schools Are Killing Creativity. It's mm-hmm. still the number one TED Talk of all time. It was a brilliantly constructed performance. Brilliant. So that's one. Um, my buddy, what, what's Adam one Rep- thing you, you liked about his performance in that talk? He used humor and storytelling to open people's hearts and minds and then drop these wisdom bombs of serious thinking Mm-hmm. in a way that people could receive them. Mm-hmm. If he just came out and was like finger wagging and attacking and dropping all these truth bombs in people's lap, it'd be overwhelming and confronting and uncomfortable. But because he wrapped that in a way that people could feel and understand, it became beautiful. It became a piece of art. Okay. Um, other favorites of mine, Adam Grant is a wonderful speaker. He's given multiple TED Talks. Highly recommend that. Uh, the one I think he did on his book of Rethink was very, very good. Uh, oh, also one on originals. I'm sorry, I did a book. I did a TED talk for originals that I'd recommend. Um, I'm a huge Malcolm Gladwell fan, wonderful storyteller. He did a moth storytelling uh, on, on YouTube um, where he, he talked to me. He actually did this thing. It was like a tribute to a friend of his who got married and he gave like a wedding speech, but it's hysterically funny. It's like 12 minutes long. It's absolutely worth watching. Actually, by the way, the people that win the moth storytelling contest, they're great. It just, Hear someone telling a story about their dog as a kid, but it's like this incredible story and worth worth listening to. Um, Dan Grant, uh, Dan Pink is a wonderful speaker. Highly recommend. Uh, great, great technique. Good tension and release. So I'm always looking for new speakers to learn from and grow. Um, my my partner uh, Ryan Estes, I think, is one of the most gifted speakers I've ever met. And so if there's anything to him worth watching. Beautiful. And if somebody wanted to work with you all. Um, first step is to, you recommend coming to a boot camp? Yeah, I mean, I would you know, check out Impact 11. There's a bunch of, in impact11.com, there's a bunch of resources there. We're happy to chat. And um, yeah, usually the first step is, is a boot camp. It's, it's like this two and a half day, fairly immersive, throw you into the pond kind of experience. But people walk away with some pretty cool stuff. Like you walk away with a comprehensive view of all the moving pieces of the industry. You walk away with a playbook, like what do you need to do next? And you walk away with a group of friends that are here to support you and do it together. And so it's a really cool thing in a business that can feel very lonely to be able to find your people who are there to support you and learn from and, and learn with and grow together. I think one of the most valuable aspects of the boot camp that I got, and I've been to a few of them now, is learning how to communicate the problem that you're solving in the world. And you guys give a specific formula for that which was very confusing to me when I first heard it, but it's actually simple. You know, this it's confusing in the simplicity, if that makes sense, um, because you kind of think it it needs to be more complicated than that, but it really doesn't, right? It just the, the broad strokes of it is you're just saying, hey, this is what I'm wanting to do. This is why I'm the person to do it. And this is what you're going to experience once I get a chance to work my my magic. And so- that formula that you all have sort of simplified, is that something you created or is that something you've known about since working with Dr. Morgan from back in the day or how did that come about? No, we created it. Um, and it was one of those things like, it's cool, but looking back on it, I, I, it just felt kind of natural. I, I wish I can say it was, but, but basically what, we're, what like describe for anyone that's unfamiliar with this little thing called PCT. And PCT is an acronym that stands for Problem Credibility Transformation. And I actually think it's the perfect way to pitch any professional service and certainly a keynote speaker. Most people 
um, if you ask, what do you do? And you ask the question, what do you do? They describe their work in terms of, of the broad category of their expertise. What do you do? I'm a keynote speaker, or I'm an innovation keynote speaker, or I'm a plumber, or I'm a musician. But a better way to do it is, is start by saying, what's the problem that you solve? That's the P. Then why are you the right person to solve it? That's C, credibility. And what does the world look like after the problem is solved? I've never done this. I just said the word plumber, so that'd be fun. You know, what do you do? Like, oh, I'm a plumber. What do you do? Well, I help homeowners that are deeply frustrated with leaks and they're, they're concerned when something goes wrong. They don't know where to turn and they're overwhelmed with stress and anxiety. And then we're deeply worried that if, if a flood occurs, it's going to create thousands of dollars of damage, wreak havoc on their family, and then the whole entire world could come crushing down on them. As someone who's won seven awards at the Global Plumbers Association and developed a proprietary toolkit methodology, uh, and, and, and it has a special step-by-step -step process, um, now, yeah. that was a quick little thing about me. Now, the transformation, once I work with homeowners, they can breathe a deep sigh of relief. They can, they can know that if something starts worrying with their plumbing from a little knocker on the toilet to a flood, um, they've got a professional to call in, and they no longer have to wallow in concern and grief. As a made-up one, it's being silly for a plumber, but you can see which is much more powerful. If you frame your expertise and first the problem that you solve, then your credibility, why you're the right person to solve it. And then finally, what does the world look like for the person once the problem is solved? I don't care if you're a doctor or a plumber or a keynote speaker or a thought leader, that formula just works. People understand it and they're willing to buy from you. So I, I highly recommend people. It's, it's actually a really good thought exercise. It's kind of your own thoughts. And as you think about your own body of work positioning, in, regardless of a field of study, like PCT, problem, credibility, transformation. Do you think anybody can be a keynote speaker? Anybody who obviously wants to be one? I think anybody who wants to be one that is willing to do the work can be a keynote speaker. That's so like there are, certain, there are certain things like I'm a growth mindset guy. I probably could never be a professional basketball player. I'm five, five on a good day. Try and work as hard as I may. Like that's just, I'm not cut out for that. But like, could I be a, a guitar player? Yeah, I could. No, that's a limitation. I had to practice, you know. Yeah, I could. And same thing with, with keynote speaking, unless there's some, you know, physical limitation. I, I think anybody can develop a, a practice of keynote speaking. Some of it is natural talent, but most of it is not. Most of it's doing the work. And by the way, if they're doing the work, it's not just learning stage skills. It's having something to talk about. It's, it's doing the research, having a body of work and expertise in a particular area. So yeah, I think if someone is, is really drawn to this, um, it is a, it's a field that is accessible. It's accessible to people of different um, ge generations, different ethnicities, different genders. I don't think there's any barrier from someone who, who has a, a message on their heart that's willing to do the work. Beautiful. And then you also have this, this venture fund called, is it Mudita? Mudita? It is. Um, so as mentioned, I started a venture fund in 2010 and I had a partner and we, we did philosophically agree. And a lot of, a lot of venture funds are very focused on like, they're, they're aggressive and they're cutthroat. It's like, I'm going to extract stuff from you. I'm going to take as much life out of you while I have my foot on your neck. And like, I, I don't want to do that. So I thought, what's the opposite? What's the judo flip? Mudita Venture Partners. And Mudita is a Sanskrit term, which means taking joy in other people's success. And I wanted to name the fund that because that's the vibe that we wanted to create. A fund of, you know, outcome focused to be clear, but, but like, generosity, kindness, compassion, let lift people up instead of kick people down. And so we, we named the fund Mudita, and I feel good about that. We, we also, in a way, not only are trying to make money, but trying to make an impact. So we have kind of this vibe where when we were eva evaluating an investment opportunity, we also say, what's the Mudita score? In other words, is the, is the product or service that help the world or hurt the world? If it's going to hurt the world, we're just not investing in it. If there's something like, hey, there's this new tech and we can make French fries faster to help obese kids become more obese. Like, no, I was not investing in it. No, thank you. So we try to invest in things that are both economically interesting, but also make the world a better place, drive some mudita. And so it's sort of this, this North Star for us to try to do the right thing a bit and try to help others and approach our investing and our support in, a, in, a, in that sense of, of generosity. And then we'll get our joy when other people succeed. And if someone has, how, how do you feel for ideas or potential projects? Um, so we, first of all, mainly invest in software companies. So if someone has a great idea for a new candy bar, it could be awesome because that, that's not in our thesis. We generally invest in companies that are post-revenue, pre-growth spurt. So if mm -hmm. a company is like just an idea on a napkin, it's too early for us. If a company already has 750 people, it's probably too big for us. So, you know, a company is doing one or $2 million a year in revenue. It's just getting rolling. They've proven that product market fit, the tech works. That's a good spot where we can be helpful. 
And by the way, if anyone's lo looking for capital, the first thing you want to do is find out what that investor's thesis is. So if you show up with a drug therapy, it could, it could cure cancer. I'd be like, that's the most amazing thing. I'm so glad you did it. I can't invest in it. We just don't invest in drug therapies. And so you want to try to match what you're looking for to the investor who invests in that type of thing. And then, of course, you can convince them why you're the right investment. But start with that. Like, is that even in the real house? Right. Okay. So you've written uh, several books now, uh, Hacking Innovation, The Road to Reinvention, Big Little Breakthroughs. Someone wanted to start diving into the body of work. What, what book would you recommend they start with? So I have four kids and four books. And you could never say which is your favorite kid, but I can say which is my favorite book. Uh, so my, my most, most recent book is called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. It's my best writing. It's the most researched. It's the most current and relevant. And really what it is, it's saying, how can we all as human beings unlock creativity regardless of our, where we sit on the org chart? How can we apply it in our families? How can we apply it in our practices, our communities, our companies? And so I, I, I'm very proud of the work. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun storytelling, a lot of unusual stories, and, and some really tangible, tactical things that people can do to, to bring that creativity that sit right inside of us all and bring it to the surface and put it into practice. Can you share uh, a story and maybe maybe the the preceding principle of that story just to kind of entice us to to check it out? Yeah, you know, I, I would set out on this kind of crazy mission to see how the most innovative people think and act. And so I interviewed CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, Grammy award-winning musicians, and, and, and everyday innovators that are less famous. And you think that these people like take these high-risk moonshots all the time, like swing for the fences, and they actually do the opposite. Yeah, I spent over a thousand hours in research and the best of the best do the opposite. They cultivate micro innovations on a high frequency basis, big little breakthroughs, little baby steps. And what that does is it, it's way less risky. It's way more accessible. Those little wins add up to big wins. And, 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 and you're also building skills over time. And so if you want to get good at big stuff, practice on the little stuff. So it's a much more pragmatic approach to injecting innovation and creativity in all walks of life. You don't have to be in wearing a lab coat or a hoodie. You can be a customer service rep. You could be a, a, a furniture craftsman, but you can find ways to inject creativity in almost any area of life. And that, that's kind of what the book is all about, is, is helping everyday people become everyday innovators. Share a story. What's, what's one story from the book? If you don't mind. Um, yeah, no, no, of course not. Um, you know, what that comes to mind, the way I opened the book is, turns out that a cigarette butt litter is a really big problem in major cities. So it actually, it's a bigger problem in the oceans than straws. Uh, it's, it's one of those pesky problems that people keep trying to throw money at it and it's just persistent. Like no one solved this problem. So there's this guy that I interviewed uh, in, in the book named Trowin Restaurant, who lived in central London. And he was not like a big fancy dude. He didn't have like 13 PhDs or fancy suits like a normal person. But the cigarette butt issue was bothering him. And he said, well, maybe I could do something. You know, maybe I could do a big little break to basically. So what he does is he creates these yellow, uh, these metal, boxes that attach to a, a signpost. And it's, a, it's sort of bright yellow paint, so it grabs your attention. The front of, the, of, of it is clear, so you can see inside. And there's like a divider that goes down the middle. What it is, is that at the top, it asks a two-part question. Like, which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? And there's a little receptacle there to put your cigarette butt in. So you're voting with your butt. And then the butts drop down, and because there's a divider and it's glass in the front, you can see like an instant bar trip. Which one is winning, hamburgers or pizza? And each week when they clear out the cigarette butts, they put a new question in there to keep it fresh. Like, who's your favorite football team? Or what's your favorite color or whatever? And so what this does is a very fun, playful way. It's simple. It was low tech. It didn't require regulatory approval. It didn't re require a billion dollars of capital or 14 PhDs, but it worked. When ballot bins are installed, they reduce cigarette litter by 80%. And he's went on to start a company. He's now in 27 countries around the world. He's making this massive impact in the cigarette butt problem. And I love this story because when we see celebrity billionaires launching rockets in space, we're like, yeah, good for them. But that feels out of reach. But any one of us could have come up with the balance Ben idea. And so the book is really about that. It's like, how can we bring our own ingenuity and creative problem solving and inventive thinking to things that matter most to us in our lives and, and drive impact? And you don't have to be a billionaire. You don't have to have a lab coat. You don't have to have a PhD. And I would imagine that that's one of the ways you define success as well is through creating impact. It's not really as much about the bottom line as it is about making a difference. I, it is for me, certainly. You know, I, I, I can say it because I've had some commercial success along the way, but, um, you know, 
money, by the way, I don't mind talking about money because I just think of it as stored energy. It doesn't mean you have to use it foolishly. You don't have to drape yourself in gold. You can use it to fund an orphanage. Like, you, there's nothing wrong with money as a concept. But, but I think you know, the, the real rewards are, are those intrinsic ones. Someone asked me the other day, I won some entrepreneur in your award. And they're like, well, wasn't that awesome? They wanted to talk about this award. I was like, listen, I'm, I'm grateful for that award. I felt good in the moment. But you know what felt better? What felt better was when a young woman walked into my office one time and she said, Josh, uh, my name is Beth. You probably don't even know me. I work in the legal department or whatever. I started here two years ago in your company. And um, I wanted to come say thank you. I'm like, thank you for, for what? I hear you're doing great work. Like, awesome. She's like, no, because my, my husband and I bought our house today. And in both of our families, we're the first person to ever buy a house. This is a milestone that both of us thought would be out of reach forever. And because I had this opportunity to come to this amazing company, I just bought a house. And so I don't get credit for that. It's her working credit. But like that is way more meaningful than any reward or any check that I've ever received. And so when you feel like you're touching people's hearts and lives and, and that, that feedback loop comes back to you, that is infinitely more powerful and rewarding than some actual you know, moniker or piece of, piece of paper. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way, I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right? Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. I met you a couple of years ago, I believe, um, at Impact 11, which is the speaker community that you co-founded. And definitely want to get into that. But before that, I always like to start with the, the superhero origin story. <laughs> and yours... Yours began in Detroit. You grew up in a single parent household. And um, you and I are kind of the same age. I was down in Alabama growing up. And while I was seven, eight years old, I was, I was, I was I, an, an artist. I was drawing. I was creating comic books. Meanwhile, up in Detroit, you were learning how to play the piano. So. Talk to me about how you got into the piano and just anything that was noteworthy around your 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 earlier years, you know, the earliest memories, your favorite activities. How did that how did that culminate in in music? Yeah, thank you. Well, so I I as much I was born in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs. My parents were divorced when I was two and a half. And, you know, I, I was frankly kind of bounced between them a little bit. And um it wasn't like, you know, there was a lot of people that had it worse than me. I'm not, I'm not complaining, you know, but, but it was kind of unstable and you know, we weren't, we didn't have a lot of resources and, and it wasn't, um, it was, it was sort of a little bit scary, frankly. And really the only way that I got attention was through achievement. Like my parents were kind of doing their own thing. And if, if I got a good grade in school, like maybe I'd get a pat on the head and I'd get noticed, but then there was like achievement inflation. So I had to do something better the next time to get a little attention. So I quickly got pretty disciplined on like, I got to achieve things probably because that was the only way, to be honest, I felt love and connection. Um, but but as part of that, um, I did love learning and I did like achieving things. I did get addicted to it, not only for those reasons, which are probably negative, but but for some positive reasons too. I like creating stuff. And and I, I've always felt like a little bit of a misfit. You know, I felt like if there was 20 kids in a class, there'd be 19 of them and one of me. Not because that was better. Actually, it was the opposite. I felt like weird and awkward and such. but. I always felt like a misfit. And so I never was called to, to follow a traditional path. And uh, so if someone's like, hey, go play sports, I said, like, what's the opposite of sports? Like, I would want to do the opposite. And uh, I did fall in love with music very early, just even as little, young as I can remember, music just ruled me. I love music. I love singing along. I like rhythm. I just loved it. And so at age eight, I started playing piano and took to it very quickly. I mean, my parents weren't musicians. I, I started learning and I just loved it. And you know, I do like little party checks, like I could name the notes by ear and such. And then uh, about a year and a half later, I switched over to guitar, which became my main instrument. And uh, and I never put it down. I mean, as I was going through middle school and high school, when everybody else was going to the prom, I was practicing and playing in smoky jazz clubs and wedding bands. And, you know, I just became very immersed in music. And that really has become a, a main through line of, of, of not only what I do, but who I am. So to use your lingo, I want to double click on this a little bit more. Um when I started drawing, I, 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 all of my friends were artists. So, you know, we would sit in a room and draw together. What was your inspiration for just thinking about playing the piano at first? Did your parents play music or did you have friends who were into music? I just kind of liked music. And, and we had like this old beaten up piano at my dad's house. And uh, 
nobody really played. I was like, can I have piano lessons? And I kind of had to beg for that. And I, you know, I started, I just took to it pretty quickly. It was, it was, it sounded weird. It was like a really organic, natural thing. It's the opposite of someone saying, come on, honey, you should learn a piano, you'll learn to play. I just wanted to learn to play. I just love music. And, um, and you know, I, I feel like it gave me a platform to learn and to be challenged. I was never bored again for the rest of my life because I can always be playing or practicing. Uh, it, it, it was, uh, it gave an outlet for creative expression. It gave me something to lean into and work toward. So it really developed a lot of skills that I found to be very helpful in other areas of life. But the, the truth is I just was drawn to it because it moved my heart. Mm -hmm. And I've read before in one of your other interviews that playing instruments uh, helped you to obviously practice and develop discipline and experience delayed gratification in being um, in being creative. And looking back now as someone who's, you know, gone well beyond 10,000 hours, as a young person, what did it take for you to excel? Like, how did you develop that discipline or that practice or that ability to, to improvise? Um, what happened was, I, I think it was probably out of fear more than anything. Like, I really wanted to be good and I was afraid of not being good. And I felt like if I, I did learn at an early age for better or for worse, if I wanted anything in life, I had to do it myself. Like my parents, again, they were wonderful people. They both passed on. I don't mean to disrespect anybody, but they weren't like real available. They were kind of in their own thing. If I wanted a bowl of cereal, like I had to figure that out. If I wanted a toy, like I had to figure that out. And so there, sure, there were some negatives, but, but like I also gained a really fierce sense of independence. And so when I started learning to play music and I looked at, at the greats, you know, the, you know, Eddie Van Halen or, or, you know, West Montgomery or whatever, I, I, I didn't think there was going to be anyone that was going to help me get there other than me. And so I just figured like the only thing I could do is out people. Like I can't, I probably don't have as much talent as they did. I can, but I can, I can hustle. And so I just have developed a pretty strong discipline at an early age. I remember many nights, even in high school, where like my friends are going out, hey, what's up? You want to go to a party? I'm like, no. And my, my party was, I poured, I, I made a whole lot of coffee and started practicing at like four in the afternoon and, you know, play a little bit, drink a coffee, play a little more, drink a coffee. And, you know, maybe two, three in the morning, I'd stop playing when my fingers hurt and I fell asleep. And, and that was it. And like, I just, I just became almost my, my monomaniacally focused on this thing and trying to get better at it and both dexterity, but ultimately then developing a voice and an outlet for creative expression. Were you a bit of an introvert? Yeah, I don't know what you mean by a bit, but I was a total introvert. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, I still am today. I was talking with some friends about this last night. I love deep conversations. Like I could hang out with you for a week and then never get bored. And if it's the people I care about in like an intimate setting, I love that. I also love being alone. I'm totally good with that. I get energized from both those things. I actually don't get energized from big crowds. I don't like schmoozing and cocktail hours. I just, I, it's, it kind of saps my energy. And I can pretend to like engage with that, but it's not energizing for me. Uh, being here in my studio and playing some music or writing or talking to you like that, that, that makes me, that fills my heart. And which musicians did you become obsessed with as a young person when you were learning and playing and, and um, just having that experience? Well, you know, at first, um, I wanted to sound like, you know, I wanted to play Stairway to Heaven so I could get girls and all that. But I had a guitar teacher very early said, listen, if you, jazz is the most complicated, difficult, physically demanding, you know, like, it's like basically you can play jazz, you can play anything. And so he sort of turned me on to, to jazz musicians. And then I really sought that out. And I said, okay, if that's true, like, how can I learn from the most you know, like weird, crusty jazz musicians I could find? You know, like they were so deep into it. And so I started studying jazz at an early age. First, because I, I wanted to learn the hardest thing to get good at it. But then eventually I was like, and I loved it. And, and, and like, like jazz is, it, it, it just so much part of my soul. And it's such a beautiful art form. It's the one art form where you're both composing and performing simultaneously. If you're a painter, you can go back and correct a mistake, look at it again the next day. Jazz isn't, you're, you're literally composing and performing simultaneously. But it's also pretty cool because it's not solo composition. I mean, I suppose you could play a solo instrument, but let's say you and I and three other guys were in a jazz group together. Every night we're inventing, but every night's different because we're all co-creating. And I might come up with a little idea and then you build on it and the drummer builds on it. And, and every night you're, it's like this musical conversation. And it, every night you're taking risks. Every night you're making mistakes and having a course correct. You're, you have to use actor listening and situational awareness to, to navigate through comp complexity. You have to make decisions in the face of ambiguity. And so like, to me, it's the ultimate teacher of what we do in 
business, certainly in, in most areas of life. And I just, it's, it's thrilling. It's like this dangerous thing where am I going to make it to the other side of it? And what's that going to be? And I just, it, I, I, I just never get bored with it. And, and it's such an element of expression. There are jazz songs that are, that are touching and heartwarming. There are jazz songs that are almost angry. And so I feel like any emotion in the, in the, in the context of all human emotion can be expressed certainly in music and specifically in jazz. I mean, there's, you can, you can really touch nerves in a way that I think at least in other art forms, you cannot. Yeah. So you, you had a couple of uh, experiences as a young person uh, selling, I think, illegal fireworks <laughs> when you were only 11 years old uh, to your friends at school. And then later on, working at a gas station when you were 13 and getting on stage in the evenings at jazz clubs at 13 years old. What was the, uh, where'd you get these ideas from, Josh? Like, how did you come up with the idea to, to, to resell fireworks <laughs> at the risk well, of potentially getting thrown out of school? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, do, do, I developed a good risk tolerance, apparently, but uh, I, I, um, I'm always like kind of scrappy and resourceful. And, you know, I saw an opportunity that the, uh, the juvenile delinquent that lived around the corner from me, I befriended and he was like, you know, 19 and I was 11 and he would take me to his basement somewhere you could get illegal fireworks. And so I, I found out that you could buy from him like 25 cents a pack for firecrackers and I, I could sell them at school for a dollar. So, you know, Hey, in business, like I, I found a distribution partner. I found a wholesale distribution relationship. I, I found a price, a uh, healthy gross margin. I mean, these are, but I didn't know that language, of course. I just threw fireworks in my backpack and went to school and sold them to all my friends. And it was a pretty robust business. I had a lot of repeat customers. It was pretty healthy until I ran into, into a regulatory problem. Uh, and actually, it's quasi a banking problem because my, my mom found all these crumpled up $20 bills in my underwear drawer because that was my banking system. And, and she's like, where do you get all this money? And so, so the, the jig was up. And the worst thing, man, is like my punishment. I had to call not my friends, but I had to call their parents. And I had to call people up and say, hello, uh, Mrs. Washington. My name is Josh Lightner. I sold your son illegal fireworks. So not only did I have no business, I had no friends for a couple of years. <laughs> you ratted everybody out. <laughs> that was bad. That was bad. And was it intimidating getting on the stage with adults to play jazz at 13 years old? Yeah, I, I think it was. Um, but I just sort of developed this, this sense of it's not fearlessness just to be clear. I have the same fears and anxieties. Like it's not that it was just more like comfortable being uncomfortable. And I felt like I didn't really have a choice into a degree. It was like, I didn't feel like I had the luxury. I'll, I'll just practice for a couple more years before I do that. I felt like this, this glide probably much of it by the baby coming from a place of fear, but it was like, I, I don't have the luxury to sit back and wait. I have to do this. I have to go try it. Even if I short up, I have to put myself in a tough situation. And so it was almost like a survivalistic instinct that I felt not doing that, even as uncomfortable as it might be, I just didn't feel like I had the luxury to not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then that prepared you to go to music school. You went to Berkeley. You came in as the highest ranking jazz guitarist. How do they rank jazz guitarists? I was curious about that. You know, you sit down in front of like this board and they do like this whole like audition thing. And then, then like they kind of give you like this numerical ranking. And, and because, you know, they, they, various course work is better for suited for someone at different levels. And um, yeah, at the time, I, 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 I did okay. So it, it was, you know, it, it was cool because I was finally just, I felt like cut free from the typical bounds of high school. And now I could, I could play music with all these people, which raised its own set of challenges and, and such. But it was, it's, it's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. And you didn't graduate from Berkeley because you started this company. And this is, this is really interesting to me because it seems like, by all metrics, you 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 discovered your life's calling to be a jazz musician, and yet you start selling computers that you assemble in your dorm room, and that sort of derails you away from the jazz thing full time to this other thing, this this tech founder. Um, how, how did you reconcile that for yourself? It's going to sound weird, but this is how I really thought about it. I just kept thinking I was playing jazz mm -hmm. because in jazz, you're, you're assembling things in different ways and you're figuring stuff out and you're problem solving and using inventive thinking and you're scrappy and resourceful. I never did get a business class, but I realized that I could buy individual components from a mail order catalog, assemble them in my college dorm, and then sell them on campus at a discounted price and still make them make some money. 
And so it was almost like if imagine, you know, if I was playing guitar and I switched to piano, you'd be like, yeah, you're still playing. You're just using a different instrument. That's kind of how I process it. I was still playing jazz. I was just using a different instrument. In this case, assembling computers instead of playing notes on, a, on an instrument. But um, it was the same skills. It was responsible risk-taking, learning quickly, course correcting when you screw something up. And that was, I'll tell you, there's no better teacher to be an entrepreneur than to be a jazz musician. Right. And at the same time, I imagine you still like being on stage lit you up and, and playing, you know, allowed you to feel alive and present and all the things. So um, did you shift in your own personal identity away from primarily being a jazz musician to being an entrepreneur who plays jazz on the side? Do you remember that being like a conscious choice that you made? I, I do, but not at that time. Because at that time, I was playing more than ever. Um, mm -hmm. It was funny. I was technically in, in, in college at this time. Um, I transferred to, to the University of Florida uh, in Gainesville, but um, I was technically at college. I almost never went. And I played music almost every night, like six, seven nights a week. I would go on the weekends and tour all over the place. I'd go to different countries and play concerts. So I was a full-time working musician and a full-time entrepreneur and technically a full-time student, although I barely went to class. So I, 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 I didn't make this like I'm giving up one thing to do another thing. I was more like I'm embracing two things. And I, you know, I have sort of that highly intense work ethic. And so what sounds weird to be saying that to you now, like, why would this 20 year old kid be doing all that stuff? I, I, I just felt like, again, like I didn't necessarily feel like I had the option to, to, to come off the throttle. I just, I just kind of kept doing both. Mm -hmm. And you sold the, the computer thing a couple of years later. Why didn't you keep that going? What, what was it that made you think I need to get out of this and, and do something else? Um. A lot of things, actually. Uh, first of all, I didn't love the business. It was okay. I learned a ton. I made a ton of mistakes. But I never saw myself doing that particular business forever. Um, I like the, the act of creating something new. Like in jazz, you're creating something new. The notion of playing the same song every night in the exact same way every night would be the antithesis of jazz. And so like doing a company and figuring it out and then just doing it that way is like the antithesis of who I was as a human being. So it, it sounds weird, but like I wasn't like, oh, I built something. I want to keep it and protect it. I was like, yeah, what if I built something else? And so um, it wasn't a huge transaction, but I did sell the company and I, I got that sort of itch to like, okay, I can build something. I like creating things out of nothing. I like the messiness of a startup environment because it reminded me of the messiness of a jazz combo. And uh, I like building things and then moving on to the next thing. Mm. So give us a little montage of what you created over those next several years professionally and, um, and, and how you sort of develop your core values that you now uh, both live by, but also I believe that you, you, um, you teach those to other innovators and creatives and speakers and, and, um, and I just, I just, you know, this, I like things like the idea of, of the, the judo flip and not keeping score and, you know, these kinds of values. So talk about, talk about your business world experiences that sort of led you to that. Yeah, so almost as quickly as I, I sold that company we talked about, I graduated, started another company. 11 months later, I sold that. In 1995, I started an internet company. Everyone's like, what's the internet? I was like, well, I could build you a website. They're like, what's a website? And it was this early time, but I, I kind of, you know, early pioneer of that that area. Sold that company in 99, started another company, which grew sizable. I was the CEO of this company called ePrize for 11 years. Through that, you know, hired thousands of people, opened offices all over the world bought and sold company. So, you know, we, I built that one to scale. But but the, the principles um, that I developed to answer your question, uh, some of them were through experience and trial and error. And some of it were, were, I think, more grounded in a sense of intentionality and purpose and almost like a religious fervor, although not in the organized dogma kind of way. But one of them, for example, I, I still talk about a lot is start before you're ready. And which is that notion of you know, take the initiative, just get started, figure stuff out as you go, which is what I did from selling fireworks and standing on stage at 13 years old and starting a company 20, never taking a business class, I wasn't ready for any of those things. And so, but I think it's actually a good, it's a portable principle. It wasn't just applies to like a, a short guy from Detroit. It applies to, to, to universally in, in, in many other contexts. So I like concepts like that that are, that I may have experienced, so I have some you know, validity in talking about, but, but, but they're more general in nature. Another one of my four beliefs is, um, is, is the notion of seeking the unexpected which is instead of gravitating to the obvious or the tried and true to challenge yourself to kind of do the opposite, which is to like, well, what, 
what can I do that was the opposite of what, what everyone else is doing? So I've always, again, I felt like a misfit. I had that oppositional nature. And so one of the techniques you mentioned this that I talk about a lot is this concept of a, a judo flip. Very fun, simple way to think about it. But if you're facing a problem or an opportunity, you just say like, okay, how have I always done this before? What's everybody else do it? What does tradition suggest? And then just ask the simple question, what's the opposite? What would it look like instead of you judo flip it? And so again, that's just a little, you know, little t- a technique. But, but the principle, you know, seeking the unexpected instead of the obvious, that's been a core principle of mine. And the last thing you mentioned, Light, is, is one that's much more personal. I try to live like, life this way, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not perfect and, and nobody is, but um, it's, it's the concept of give generously, don't keep score. And I'll just unpack that a little bit because it, it, to me, it's more than a catchphrase. First of all, it's a belief in abundance. And so if I feel like there's scarcity, that means if I give you something that I, I, I'm taking away from my family, but if you look at the world differently, like in a sense of there's abundance and, and you can create net new things, you don't have to leave, protect the things that exist. That, that alone is this hugely freeing concept. The second thing is like, if you say, what's my purpose here? Well, is, is it to just amass economic gains or is it to serve others and help the world? So the notion of give generously, don't keep score. It's more of the social, like, can I, can I contribute? Can I elevate others? Can I make a difference in people's lives in the context of abundance without saying, well, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? I'll do that. I'll do X because I inspect Y. And so to me, it's a kind of a beautiful way to go through life. And my wife, who is very protective and loving, T is awesome and, and she's the love of my life. Sometimes she's like a little protective. She's like, you know, you, you get taken advantage of sometimes by doing this. And I said, you know what? I'd rather get taken advantage of 10% of the time and walk through the world being that way. I'm okay with that. That's okay. Because the opposite is what I don't want to do, which is think in scarcity and protectionism. And, and, and you know, I, I say, no, I'm, I'm okay. If I get help, it happens. It's a choice. I came across this wonderful anecdote uh, speaking of getting taken advantage of, uh, about you on an airline flight and you had been upgraded and some guy that you were trying to do a business with had also been upgraded. Can you share that anecdote just to kind of give a real world uh, example of what we're talking about? Sure. Um, so I was I was trying to win a massive account for my company and, and we, my little company from Detroit and we're competing with two much larger competitors. And this one very large you know, multinational Fortune 500 company I was going to give a huge contract to, to a, a company in my space. And I'm trying really hard to get the, the decision maker to, to agree. And he was really like kind of mean and condescending and dismissive and arrogant. And, and he was dragging the decision process out, he kept setting a deadline to make a decision. And then he blew every deadline. So we were all getting frustrated. Anyway, I saw him and his wife at an industry conference in Arizona. And uh, at every coffee break and every meal, I'm like racing up to him, trying to get him to sign the deal. And he was like, totally dismiss it. Get away from me. Stop it. Just leave me alone. And so I just felt like there's no way we're going to win this. It's over. But I, I saw him and his wife at the airport. It turned out, oddly, we were both on the same outbound flight. So here's what happens next. This guy gets an upgrade to first class because he's, he's a frequent traveler. And being, being the gentleman that he is, he takes the seat for himself and sends his wife back to coach. I mean, just for the record, like if I tried that with Tia, there's no chance. Like this, I meant that in the realm of the universal possibility of things. <laughs> anyway, I also got an upgrade. So I walk on the plane and I have the seat next to him. And so our first instinct is like, you know, sit down, sell, take command, you know, all the, all the things that any, any entrepreneur would be thinking. And I did something different. I mean, you might call it actually, by the way, a judo flip. If the first instinct is to sell and, and take that seat, what's the opposite? So I said to him, hey, I, I have the seat next to you. And he's like, oh, that's right, we can chat. And I said, instead of like pulsing, I said, I'd love that. But I plan to catch up on some work on this flight. And I noticed that your wife is sitting in the back. So how about we switch seats? You two can enjoy some family time. I'll get my work done back in coach. And he wasn't especially thankful. He was, you know, whatever. He's kind of like, whatever. And I walk it back to the fight his wife. And I'm, like, I'm shaking a little. I was like, was that the dumbest thing I've ever done? But, but I did think that, first of all, I owed it to my team to try something new. And also... It just felt like the right thing to do. I really wasn't trying to game it so much as it just felt like the right thing to do. So I, I found his wife and, and he gave her my ticket and she gets all excited and, and she's all teared up. Like, thank you so much. This means the world to me. And I was thinking like, I don't know why you even want to sit with your husband, but that's, that's a whole different story. He seems like such a jet. But hey, so the, the, the flight takes off. I wasn't thinking about it that much. And, but when we land, of course, we check our mobile device. And the first thing I, t- I see is an email from my office. Um, the, the, the company signed the deal. And, and so what happened was that this guy, after I gave the seat away, texted into his office and says, I'm going with this, this company. 
And um, it was a $30 million contract, won through an act of, in this case, of generosity. So it did come back to me, although again, I wasn't trying to game it as much as I just thought it was the right thing to do. But my experience in life is kind of like that. If you try to be greedy, you, you seldom get what you're going for. If you give generously, don't keep score, the, the thing that the greedy person craves ends up kind of falling in your lap. Yeah, I love that lesson because, you know, like you're, you're right. I think sometimes you will probably get taken advantage of and maybe you would lose a million dollars in people taking advantage of you. But then if you can convert that just from being a generous person and leading with that generosity of spirit and it brings in, you know, tens of millions of dollars and it was it was all worth it at the end of the day. And you've raised hundreds of millions of dollars as a venture capitalist, and you know you've also sold your company and and made you know really a really big nest eggs out of that. And as someone who's been surrounded by tech founders and capitalists and just been very involved in in that scene, would you say that? leading with that generosity of spirit is more the exception or have you started to see that more and more in other people? Um, I think I've seen it more and more in other people. I think it's still probably, unfortunately, an exception. I don't blame anybody. I mean, we're all you know, trying to do the best in the circumstances in that moment, I, I'm sure. But um, you know, I think that you know a lot of people grew up in a scarcity world. I mean, I did too, by the way. I, mean, I didn't come from like a position of means or something. But um, I just looked at the world a little different. But I am seeing a bigger sense of, I think, you know, connectedness, compassion. You know, there, there's a real sense of you know, whole, wholeheartedness, uh, human-centered growth. So I, I am seeing a little shift in the right direction. I, I hope that continues. Just talk a little bit about purpose. And in your experience, how do you know you're kind of in your purpose? Because, you know, as an entrepreneur, especially a lot of times you don't know if what you're working on is going to pan out. To, even if you're feeling like you're you're implementing lots of creativity and innovation. How do you know that you're doing what you're you're meant to be doing? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things that you kind of look in your heart and you know, reflect on it a bit. But um, the one thing is, um, I would I would advise if you feel like okay, this is my purpose. That's such a big commitment. Like, what if I'm wrong? Maybe instead of thinking of it as your purpose forever, you think about it as your purpose for now. Mm -hmm. And so if my purpose for now is helping to unlock creativity across the world, that might be my purpose forever, but it might not. I might have a different purpose five years from now. I might be called to do something that's different. And so just the, the optionality that if I say that's my purpose, it doesn't mean it's going to automatically be etched on my gravestone. It's way more freeing. So you, you, could have a, you could have a purpose for now. You know, and by the way, you could also hold multiple purposes in, in, at one time. Part of my purpose is to be a good dad to my four kids. Um, I probably fall short more than I ought to, but it is a calling and purpose that's equally important to my body of work. So, you know, I think that, I, but the reason I say all that is when you say, what's your purpose? It's such a big question and you're so afraid to get it wrong. You might just do nothing. You might just freeze up. And I'd rather people just get started on something and see how it feels right on for six months. And if you don't, if you feel deeply compelled to continue, awesome. If you don't, try something else. I love it. Well, look, I wanted to have you on because you've made such a positive impact on my life. And, um, you know, it's, it's in my experience, it's rare when you meet someone who feels like they're, they're full body in, 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 they're full bodied in their purpose and they're walking their talk. And, um, and I just want as many people who follow me to know about you and your work. And um, and if anybody has any inkling of desire to explore keynote speaking, make your way to one of the Impact Eleven boot camps ASAP. And um, it's not cheap, you know, but you have to make that investment within yourself if you really want to get the return that I think most people envision when they see themselves having uh, speaking gigs and flying around and doing it at a very high level, you know, you have to treat it like you say, a full-time job and their startup costs and, and you all give so much value, uh, to, for those experiences. So I would, I would highly encourage everyone to go to, is it impact11.com? Yep. It's impact11, the word is spelled out, E L E V E N uh, dot com. And we're happy to help. And if it's not right, but that's okay too. But if we can be a help and service, awesome. Beautiful. Well, thanks hey, again. Before man. we say goodbye, I just wanted to tell you one quick, if I may, um, 
Because sure. I just want to show you, you had a really cool impact on me yeah. recently. And um, so I, in my interactions with you, you talk about being grounded and present and, and, and this notion. And I tend to be the opposite at times, unfortunately. I can be for not, I can kind of bounce them around. <laughs> and um, I played a jazz concert last week in, in Las Vegas. And I, I was working with incredible musicians, absolute master great musicians. We're playing six nights a week. You know, they're, they're in the peak of their... And I, you know, I, I, I'm out of practice. Like my shops are what they used to be. I don't play as much as I, you know. And so I had a lot of anxiety coming into that. I was nervous because I was like, oh, well, my technical prowess isn't as good and they're going to think less of me and you know, the audience is going to know. And like, I have this imposter syndrome going on. And, and, I, and I, when I showed up, I decided I had like a light Watkins moment. I said, I'm going to approach this differently. Instead of trying to show everybody my technical skills or whatever, I'm just going to be present. I'm going to be the... Maybe not the best musician on the stage, but maybe be the best listener. I'm going to listen intently to everybody else, and I'm going to try to support that. That's my goal, not to show off during a solo. I'm going to voice a chord a certain way that makes the piano player sound better. I'm going to do a little rhythmic thing on the guitar to make the drummer feel better. And so I just approached it in a really different way than I ever had before. And I, really, I, I was holding you in my head when I was thinking this, like, what if I just was deeply present and just approach it and had no, dis- like, I wasn't connected to some outcome other than service and, and presence. So we played this game and it felt great and we're like having this great time. And this never happened to me before. So I want to tell you this. After the, the, the event, the drummer comes up and gives me a bear hug. Not like a, like a little, eh, you know, hey, dude, like, like a hug on, like heart, heart. And he said, man, he says, I played with a lot of guitar players and they're always trying to play fast. So I've never played with someone that listened the way you did. Mm. He said, I felt like you captured the soul of the groove. Soul of the groove, like my mind is exploding, I'm getting all teared up. And he's like, and, and so the other guys came over and we had like this whole thing. He's like, oh, it was awesome. We just connected musically. And it was like this beautiful sense of spirit and connection that was all wild into this music. And, and it was funny because like my, my job sucked compared to theirs, just to be clear. Like, I, I'm not as, I'm out of shape musically. And then they start saying, when are you coming back? And like, oh, I work at this jazz club and we can get us in for a gig. And they wanted to talk about playing more. And the reason I bring all that, first of all, is a nod to you, my friend, because I was a chapter that channel what would let Watkins do and, and be present and grounded. But also, it's funny because I got a better outcome, not by ripping tightly, but by, by releasing a bit. And your instructions to like, to sort of like, let, let the river flow a bit. And, uh, and I learned that from you. I just want to share that it was a, it was really a beautiful musical moment for me. And I, I owe you a lot of gratitude for that. Thank you, man. I, re- I received that. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I did have a question though. How do you get these gigs? Are you on some circuit that people call you and say, hey, we're performing in Cleveland. You want to come? Or how does that work? I do get called like that. I usually don't, I'm not able to do it. What happened was this one was tied to a keynote. So I did a keynote in the morning for a very large organization. And, you know, they knew I played music and we talked, I'd done this a couple of years in a row for them actually. And then they hired me to perform a concert at night in front of their 2000 guests. And so I, I, I was sort of the band leader, if you will. So I hired the local musicians, mm-hmm. even though they were better than me, I, I kind of orchestrated the whole thing, which is, that's how I got the gig. They didn't call me, I, I called them. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, look, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. And um, and I look forward to seeing you again, maybe in San Diego in a couple of weeks. Thanks, again. Can't wait. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.